I need to warn you up front, this week's episode is a bit more, quite a bit more, raw and edgy than our normal content. We are going to take an honest and candid look at the awkward subject of paying for sex or prostitution. So if you are sensitive or squeamish, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you might want to skip this one. I'll be right back after this quick word from our sponsor. Hey guys, Ashley here. Are you having trouble meeting the right girl? Are you struggling due to lack of confidence, not knowing what to say, or not having a plan? Are you tired of being told to act confident around women without being told how? If so, I'd like to introduce you to the Gentleman's Guide to Flirting book from David Sharp. If you are afraid to approach women in public, this book is for you. If you aren't having success meeting women on dating websites or apps, this book is for you. If you're having trouble connecting with women on dates, this book is for you. The Gentleman's Guide to Flirting has loads of modern, field-tested, and ready-to-use examples to help you confidently approach women and meet great women either in person or online. It also has practical, real-world advice to help you truly get the most out of the dating process. And it has thoughtful, practical advice for cultivating and sustaining your relationships for the long term. It's got it all, and you're going to love it. The book's website is gentlemansguidetoflirting.com. That's gentlemansguidetoflirting.com. You can go to gentlemansguidetoflirting.com and click the Buy Now button. Or just search for Gentleman's Guide to Flirting by David Sharp on Amazon.com or anywhere else you buy your favorite books or ebooks. And start changing your life now. Hello there once again. Welcome to episode 44 of the Gentleman's Guide to Flirting podcast. I am David, the author of the book of the same name, Gentleman's Guide to Flirting, available on Amazon.com and everywhere else you find your favorite books or ebooks worldwide. Like I mentioned in the introduction, this episode is a little different. This episode is going to be more raw and more edgy than most of the prior ones, so be forewarned. All right, what am I talking about? What if you have read the book? And you've listened to the podcast and you are thinking, hey, this book's approach is a lot of work. And it is. This guy asks for a lot. Why shouldn't I instead just pay for sex? That way, I get satisfied physically in that way while getting to skip all of the work and effort and trouble the book talks about. That's a valid question. Well, my response to that is, let me give you a real world example to consider. I have a friend who is married with two young children. Now, he is not happy with his wife of many years and has felt that way for a long time. He doesn't want to be married anymore, but what he is doing, like so many couples with children do, is wait until their young children have grown up and are out of the house to divorce. They're off to college, they're out working, whatever it is, they, they're off, out of the house and off on their own. Well, that is his plan, and she doesn't necessarily know about it. But anyway, what he is considering doing for companionship, or I guess I should say specifically sex, after they are separated, is to hire an escort once a month to take care of that need. He wants to give up on being in a relationship altogether after after being kind of exhausted, being disappointed and frustrated with his current marriage. Anyway, the long-term portion of that story, the long-term portion, avoiding that type of long-term unhappiness or misery even, is related to why I wrote the book in the first place and why I'm doing these podcasts. I'm trying to help men and people by the millions avoid that situation. Now, the monthly escort part of his plan, you know, meaning paying for sex once a month to you know, take care of that need, is related to the subject of this particular podcast episode. So, once again, why go through all of the effort in the book when you can just pay for sex is the question I'm posing here in this episode. Let's take a candid, honest, and open-minded look at that. Candid, honest, and open-minded. Now, we have listeners from all over the world now for this podcast. In fact, consistently over half of everyone listening each week is from outside of the United States. 
So I want to talk about paying for sex from a global perspective, and that means across many cultures and in different places where prostitution and paying for sex is legal. I live in the United States, so I, I'm worried that my views are kind of biased from my you know lived experience here in the United States, but I, I have traveled extensively all over the world. I've lived overseas for four years out of my life, so I have a little bit of perspective on this. Again, I live in the United States, so I'll start there. In most places in the United States, paying for sex is illegal. Prostitution is illegal. There is no countrywide or federal law against prostitution in the, in the U.S. It is a state-by-state state matter. Every U.S. state except one, except one has made prostitution illegal. That one exception is the state of Nevada in the western part of the United States. And that exception only applies to a few counties in the state of Nevada. I think it's eight. All right. Why am I talking about the legality of paying for sex and prostitution first? Well, that is because my opinion and my answer to the question under consideration in this episode partly depends on the legality of paying for sex in your area or where you live. Apart from the obvious potential criminality of the act, I bring up the question of legality in any given area for a few reasons. One is, where prostitution is illegal, it still happens, and that has been true worldwide for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. The prostitution trade, where paying for sex is illegal, also normally involves abuse of women, human trafficking, and crime, and drug abuse, and all manner of harm and damage to people. Where prostitution is legal can be accompanied, but not necessarily always, with at least some protections for providers, health standards, and meaningful and beneficial controls to protect the women and the customers. But looking back to our premise, if you are married or in a relationship, and everything else is right, it's fine, except for the sex part of it, for the man or for the woman, is it okay to address that one issue, that one thing, a valid human need, outside of the relationship, possibly with paid services? I don't know where you stand on this subject, and to be honest, I am not sure there is a clear answer that works for everyone, but I think it is helpful to take a look at how different places around the world have allowed paid sex to exist, at least to some extent, for those seeking it. So let's talk about how a few places around the world have handled this issue. I mostly want to run through this list quickly for the benefit of those who haven't seen other options for how whole societies or communities deal with the question of prostitution and the societal impacts and circumstances of it. First, I'll tell you up front, man to man, that if you go to or live in some of the quote-unquote best places on earth for paid sex, you might think you are in heaven initially when you first get there. I guess that is more of a common reaction for a guy who comes from a place where the sex trade is illegal or not allowed by religious custom or something like that. That guy might go nuts initially when he sees the beautiful women and then if the cost is kind of low and everything is just plentiful and the alcohol is cheap and it's a party atmosphere and he's not mindful of the various risks that he's about to take on upon himself. But please hear me all the way out. Here are a few examples. First up on our world tour, Asia. We'll touch on three places there. Now, most of my examples are from my personal observations from back when I was in the military and traveling extensively around various parts of Asia for three years. First up is South Korea. Prostitution is illegal in South Korea as I uh, record this in 2021. However, I'll give you an example. Uh, it's, it's illegal, but it's everywhere. So I think South Korea is an example of a place that doesn't have like a modern contemporary approach to containing the issue and making the best of arguably a bad situation. For example, in some barber shops in South Korea, you can get a blow job after every haircut for around $20. So the $20 is the haircut and the post haircut special service there. 
Here in the United States, we do have some Korean barbers. We've got like normal, every kind of barbershop, but we have some Korean barbers here. Uh, a barbershop visit with a Korean barber means you get a you get great service and maybe a nice, nice neck and upper shoulder massage after the haircut, which is awesome. But for a single guy in South Korea, or for maybe a not-so-single guy, either living or visiting uh, South Korea, it might be a little difficult to turn down a post-haircut blowjob for a low price from the pretty lady that just tightened up your haircut. So South Korea, again, is not a great example, a place where it's illegal and they got problems all over the country. Not saying the South Korea things have gone to hell in a handbasket, but I don't think they have a handle on it. Now, let's move over to the Philippines. In normal times, guys had their choice of beautiful women in plenty of bars everywhere for very small cost. The beer was cheap, there was generally a safe party atmosphere, and large numbers of young, beautiful women out who liked foreigners. Now, in times of turmoil in the Philippines, for example, when there's civil unrest or protests, when the base, the military bases were locked down, the local women, I'm sorry to say, might meet the guys at the perimeter fence of the base and trade sexual services uh, through a chain link fence uh, for something as simple as an apple. So yes, you could get a blowjob for an apple in some cases. I understand if that sounds impossible, but maybe you haven't seen how bad poverty can be out in the world. I kind of consider that abusive, um, but the world is what it is. Warp ahead to now, as I record this again, it's 2021. I think now most of the sex trade is in the tourist areas in various parts of the Philippines. But there are problems with diseases and abuse of the women and sex trafficking and all the ugliness that can accompany the sex trade when it's not legal in the country. So that's two out of two. That's not good. Let's take a look at Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, and the, and the tourist areas and the entertainment districts in Thailand. Briefly, sex is for sale in entertainment districts and where foreigners come for vacations. The foreigners come loaded with cash. Thailand's not a rich country to, to a large extent, so paid sex is plentiful with beautiful women, but so is the risk of disease, including rampant AIDS and the customers being the victim of crime. So on top of the abuse of the women and possible trafficking and like forcing women into prostitution, there's all kinds of crime and drugs and disease all around it. So there's another example of maybe not such a great way to go handle that as a society. I do believe the sex trade in Thailand is largely confined to entertainment districts because Thailand is kind of a conservative place, really. And I don't believe the sex trade is spread all over Thai neighborhoods. But, you know, that's that's the situation there as I understand it. Let's warp over to Europe and take a look at a, a handful of places there. First up is Vienna, Austria. Vienna, Austria. Or the whole of Austria. Prostitution is legal in Austria, unlike the uh, places in Asia that we just went over. Prostitution is legal in the whole of the country of Austria, as far as I know. So let's take a look and see how that might be different. Does that make any difference at all? If you go to an Austrian city like Vienna, that's the big one, right? Or travel around the countryside, you don't see street prostitution out in public. You don't see it on the street, out in the open. What you might see in a major city like Vienna isn't necessarily a brothel just kind of blaring out. And I don't really recall there being red light districts in Vienna when I was there for about a week looking around as a just as a tourist. For example, in some areas of Vienna, they do have places that are um, a little weird. Like you, you, you can go into some places. Remember, prostitution is legal there. So you can go into a place and, and they'll have like pornographic mo movies you can watch. You can stand there, watch porn, but in front of you, like at one, f like half a floor, half a, like a, a few steps down from you at another level, there's a platform underneath with ladies there who will give you a blowjob for a fee while you stand there with possibly other guys at other stations in the building in plain sight. So the picture is you're while you're standing there at a rail watching porn on a screen or something like that. And you can talk to the lady underneath and say, Hey, can you 
give me service there. Or I think you can ask her if she wants to meet you in another room inside the facility and have, you know, full sex in a, in a room by, your, by yourself with her. Uh, but that's one way to, I guess, carve it up. That's how they've done that in Austria. I'm not saying it's the only way sex happens. It's just thought that was a different approach. But my point is, Austria has made prostitution legal, but you don't see it everywhere. The Austria cities, in the cities, in the countryside, large cities, small cities, you don't see them going to hell in a handbasket. They're not just dens of dirtiness and filth and evil and problems. The people who want to go and avail themselves of Sexual services can do so. So let's take a look at another place, uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. Prague. Prostitution is legal in the Czech Republic, the whole country in the Czech Republic. But not anything organized like a brothel or some sort of company. It can't be some organized thing. But prostitution itself is legal with that caveat. But for some reason, if you travel to Prague, which is a beautiful city, rich in history with a great tourism business, and I highly recommend it, it is gorgeous. The, they, they seem to have actual brothels, despite what I'm reading, like in Wikipedia, on the, on the page describing prostitution in Prague, the legality of it. Uh, I, I recall seeing places, businesses there, where you could go in and there's like women there selling sex in rooms. The women go in, they run a room, there's security there, there's like... A snack bar it's safe there's guards and stuff there and they can apply their trade safely in there with that and, and keep the criminals away there's no you know always go pull a gun on you and rob you in there for the for the for the lady or the customers so i don't quite understand that while there are companies there like whole buildings where that, that seem like technically brothels but maybe there's some kind of legal way they escape that um law in, in the czech republic but anyway I didn't see streetwalkers all over Prague for some reason. Like I stayed in a hotel in a touristy area just for convenience because I wasn't familiar with the place and I didn't know anybody there. And every once in a while you would see like a streetwalker like trying to pick up guys around the hotels, outside the hotels. But I think this is that was an example of maybe it's a woman who can't pass any the health screening or the security controls or it's actually uh red flag and there's actually a you know a crime about to happen there you know generally speaking if you're in a country or a place that has legal prostitution just go follow the rules uh if you're going to avail yourself of those services stay away from the street walkers because the street the, the girls walk in the streets may not be healthy enough or maybe have drug problems or maybe cannot um, get be licensed the official government way to go and apply their trade. So you're taking your chances if you deal with the streetwalkers, my point there. Now, in the Czech Republic, while you might see some incredibly beautiful women in those places, in, in the um, brothel-like places, who seem safe and protected and secure on the surface, the Czech Republic also has a serious problem with traffic of trafficking of vulnerable women as part of the sex trade. That's terrible, obviously, but a lot of people come to the Czech Republic for the brothels. You know, the Czech Republic's kind of like in Central Europe, and it's an easy drive from a lot of places, and the women are gorgeous, and a lot of guys come from other um, countries to try to take advantage of the lower prices and and their services. So the Czech Republic is a strange mix of containing the sex trade to a large extent away from neighborhoods and schools and normal people, but at the horrific, horrific cost of human trafficking. So that's another example. No conclusions here. Let's, let's keep going. Amsterdam in the Netherlands. That's got, you know, the red light districts and something called tipple zones that you may have seen in the news because Amsterdam is kind of famous for its red light district. Now, Prostitution in the whole of the Netherlands is both legal and regulated. But that legal activity seems to be contained in red light districts and not sprawling all over every Dutch city. So that keeps that activity away from most neighborhoods. And I think that is desirable. We can agree, right? Like if you spend a lot of money for your house and in Amsterdam, you don't want to have a sex trade happen right outside your front door, right? Now, in Amsterdam, there is still an issue with street prostitution, like I talked about in 
Prague in the Czech Republic to an extent. In Amsterdam, they have that problem too. But that, again, is mostly women who cannot pass the required regular health screening that's required to be able to work in the red light district at an official window, at a, like an official place. So if you ever decide to use those services anywhere in the world, Amsterdam or anywhere in the world, again, to be clear, I'm not recommending that you do that. We'll get to that later. But if you do decide to go and pay for sex someplace, you need to understand that people not working in the regulated places maybe cannot work in the right place due to health issues. So don't pick up someone cheap outside of your hotel or you came across on the street because you might end up catching something, a disease I mean, or being the victim of a crime yourself. Now, before I move on, I want to mention something called tipple zones, the Dutch tipple zone, T-I-P-P-E-L-Z-O-N-E, it's all one word, which I think are an interesting social compromise to street walking that the Dutch have come up with to kind of supplement the concept of a red light district. So you got red light districts, they got like girls working in windows selling sex, right? But you also have these tipple zones, which are places where motorists can park their cars and knowing that prostitutes congregate at the tipple zone where they're, they're knowing that customers will be driving up so they can go and ply their trade there at the tipple zone. Like the girl will get in the car with you and you guys negotiate whatever it is you want to do, uh, conduct the act. There may be police there, you know, to make sure there's no crime. There's no, nothing bad happening to the ladies or to the guys. Right? So you have sex in the car or you can drive off with her if with her permission. Of course, I think tipple zones are used as another way to drive the sex trade away from neighborhoods and schools and normal society in Dutch cities off to control places, again, where a police can monitor to make sure nothing gets out of hand and any trash and debris from the sexual acts can go into trash receptacles and stuff that are at every park installed in the tipple zone. So that's interesting. I saw, again, just looking at a higher level there for Amsterdam and all Dutch cities. I'd, I've been there a few times and in, in, to the Netherlands a few times, and I didn't think, I didn't see despite how soft they are on drugs and how soft they are on prostitution, the place isn't going to hell in a handbasket again, right? It's not like you got crime and drugs and stuff everywhere. That kind of activity is concentrated in the um, zones where they're supposed to be. And I think, generally speaking, if you live in a regular Dutch neighborhood and you can send your kids to school and they're not going to be bothered or see any of that kind of, um, I want to say illicit activity, but uh, it's legal there. So let's go over, let's talk about Germany for a second. Very briefly, prostitution in the whole of Germany, just like the Czech Republic and just like the Netherlands, is both legal and regulated. I've been to several cities in Germany, traveling around, enjoying different parts of Germany. I loved it. And again, I don't think society is falling apart there. If you, people who don't want to go see prostitutes, just don't go to the parts of the city where the entertainment districts are, where the kind of red light district activities are and that kind of draws all the sex trade over to those areas and you can have adequate police presence there and germany uh, so as far as i know and based on my direct observations does keep that very much under control you know guys get liquored up they get drunk if they get a little wild or violent with the ladies the hammer of justice is quick to fall on them but again, I don't think, I think Germany's got the situation under control for people who want to avail themselves of prostitutes and the sex trade and sex services. You do it in certain areas of certain cities and keeps the problems from spilling out and where to people who don't want to look at that or see that in their communities. A couple more quick things we'll talk about uh, before we move on. Uh, Canada. Canada, next door to me, my northern neighbor, uh, Canada has some weird laws that I frankly don't understand. I've read the rules, but I don't understand the intent or impact. Like Canada says prostitution's legal, but a person can't benefit from the trade. So that's a really strange thing that doesn't like compute in my brain. But if, so if someone does reach out to you, please tell me if someone does understand how this works in Canada, please reach out and tell me. And I'll go and update this content to give, give to make sure everyone has the most accurate information possible there. But I don't, th I think, I don't think Canada's, Canada's got a rampant problem with streetwalkers. Whatever they did, I think enables like paid escort services for sex. Like I think you can go to some place like Toronto on business and 
if you need to blow off some steam or something, you know, and this is something that you're comfortable doing or you're single or whatever, just decide it's appropriate for you. You do it nice, some nice, honest and organic way. I think you can call escort to your room in like Toronto and, um, I think that's okay. I don't think the police will bother you with that. Right. So back to, back to the United States where I live again, Nevada is the only U S state where the sex trade is allowed. And that is only in a few counties in Nevada. Those are mostly in rural places. And I cannot gauge if having those has helped or not across the whole state because of the, 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 the legality of it's just uncertainly spar certain sparsely populated counties. The city I'm most familiar with in Nevada, Las Vegas, has a thriving sex trade, but that is illegal. Las Vegas is not in one of the counties where prostitution is legal. So sorry, the United States is just too messed up to help us learn anything good on this subject. We only have bad lessons over here illustrating much of the worst of what can happen when you leave prostitution largely illegal and you force it to be off in the dark corners of society and you've got drug abuse and human trafficking and abuse of the women and guys strong armed people and organized crime and every kind of bad thing that can possibly accompany that is happening in the United States. A couple of things in summary. Now, whether paying for sex is legal or not, where you live, legal or not, you need to be aware that there is a wide perception that men who visit even legal prostitutes are often less respected. I'm not saying that I subscribe to that opinion. I am very much a live and let live and open-minded person, but still it's a shameful thing. As far as I know, most everywhere in the world I'm familiar with, I don't think guys in Thailand in the Philippines in the Czech Republic and Prague in Germany go around bragging that they had to go get release at a, with a prostitute, but to each his own there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. My second summary conclusion is that for places that have, around the world that have legalized prostitution, the goals included confining that activity to certain places, enforcing some health standards, policing crime, stopping the abuse and trafficking of women, and maybe taxing the trade itself to help pay for all that. Those sound like very desirable results in my opinion. And I think that for places like where I live in the United States, we can learn from the example of some of the places that are a little more progressive and have handled the situation quite a bit better. Uh, you know, again, those sound like desirable results in my opinion, but does that mean every man should use those services? That's a huge question. It's going back to the point of this episode. So let's look at the downside here. Let's look, let's talk about the risks of using paid services for sex. And there's a lot of them. First up, health-wise, it isn't the 1970s or 1980s anymore. The old-timers, you may be talking to old-timer guys who are saying that they had sex with hundreds or thousands of women back in the 70s or 80s. Those, those days are, are past and it's not a good idea anymore to be so promiscuous. Diseases, AIDS, herpes, and many other sex, sexually transmitted diseases are out there everywhere and some of which we still have no cures for and they can wreck your life. Another problem is, especially and in the United States at least, I don't have insight into the rest of the world here on this, on this point, uh, but condom use is down and I don't know why. Condom use is down, especially in the paid sex trade, at least in the United States. So if you're out in the United States availing yourself, you're availing yourself of paid sex services, you got to understand that a lot of the guys out there, the other customers are insisting or asking that that is done raw, no condoms. So that increases the risk of diseases transferring from one person to the other, right? Now, again, I don't know why condom use is down, but it is dramatically down over the past several years. Now, maybe something has changed around awareness of sexually transmitted diseases or people just aren't as scared of contracting AIDS these days. Or, and I hope this isn't the case, but maybe things are falling apart uh, due to few people feeling despair and they're not as worried about their health or having a prosperous future as maybe people felt in prior years. And maybe they're just not concerned about being harmed by catching some dread disease. So hence, why use the condom? I, I don't know. All I know is I don't like it. I don't think it's helpful. And I hope that's not the situation where you live. 
Next risk is there is a possibility of the shame of you getting caught or outed after having used or have pursued, you know, trying to buy sexual services. Even if you don't get caught in the act or after the act, there's still the walk of shame that you do. Even if you don't get caught, you know what you did, right? Or you could get caught. Courts or cops might seize your car or other property involved in the crime. Here in the United States, uh, like the penalties, the laws depend based on the state and sometimes based on the city for like if you get caught using the services of a prostitute or the kind of charges she may be looking at for offering prostitution services. So it's a crime. So you got to worry about the police. In some places, what they'll do is if the police are running an operation where they're going and like pretending to be a prostitute and just like arresting a lot of guys, they're allowed to put your name, your face, your mugshot, maybe your, and maybe your address on the local news or in the local newspaper. So do you want to chance having a criminal record and having that surface and be an issue for you for potentially for the rest of your life? Is that what you want? Is that temporary satisfaction, blowing off the steam of getting that blowjob or, ha or having a little bit of sex for a few minutes with a lady worth, if it's a crime in your area, having your name blasted out through the local news, on TV, in the newspaper, where your family and your friends and your coworkers and your clients and your customers can see. It could be ruinous for your reputation. Next up, still on the subject of risks, there is a chance of you being made the victim of a crime in your pursuit of the act, right? You could get robbed of your money, of your vehicle. You could be forced to go to an ATM or bank machine or cash machine, whatever it is you call it in your area, and forced to drain your account empty. What if you go pick up a woman, right? And then her boyfriend or, or two jumps out puts a gun to your head and says, drive to an ATM, drive to a bank machine and go drain all the money out of it. What are you going to do? Right. And even after that happens, like, are you going to go to the police and say, well, you know, I was about to commit a crime here and be a customer of a prostitute and I got robbed doing it. You're really going to do that. You're going to put yourself through that. And if things go really wrong, like if you buck and you decide to, if things turn violent, if somebody tries to rob you, uh, you could get killed, right? You could lose your life in that process. Guys could jump out with weapons and maybe they don't want to leave a, a victim around, right? They could, could jump out, rob you of your car, rob you of your wallet and um, kill you. So you can't witness on them. Next risk is next. Your money could be enabling a drug habit for her and for those around her. All right. I'll leave that one as is. All right. Um, there's also the risk of unwanted pregnancy. Like uh, if you get a prostitute, pregnant, you're still responsible there just because it's a criminal act, right? If it's a if prostitution's illegal, just because it's a criminal act doesn't mean that you're not responsible as a father if you get her pregnant. And what if you do get her pregnant because you insisted on not using a condom and she gets pregnant for, for some reason, right? What if she fi finds out who you are from your license plate or the phone number you called her from? the license plate of the car you picked her up in, or something else you told her, your contact information on social media, email address, you texted her or something like that. She gets pregnant and then she shows up at your doorstep in front of your wife or your girlfriend or your children or your family. She shows up at your doorstep saying, hey, I'm pregnant. Do you want that? Do you want that problem? Same issue you have with like with, with any other woman, but you know, I'm just trying to be thorough about the risks of using a prostitute in here, right? Next thing is, well, if she doesn't get pregnant, but she still has your contact information and she or her boyfriend or her pimp or her handler decides to start harassing you or try to go and extort money from you by embarrassing you and saying, hey, I, you, I have proof that you came to visit me. You bought sexy piece of shit and I want you to give me $5,000 or $1,000 to keep my mouth shut. Right. That's another risk. There is a risk of you accidentally engaging the services of an underage woman. Right. And it doesn't matter that you paid for the sex. It doesn't matter that she didn't understand she was underage. It doesn't matter that if she lied to you. If the, if the fact is that she's underage and you had sex with her and made a jurisdictions around the world, you are plain straight up guilty. Right. And law enforcement and the court system in your area might not care if you didn't know or if she lied to you. 
you can catch some serious jail time over that. Now, we, we have rules in the book for like normal situ normal dating and flirting situations to cover things, but I just want to kind of reiterate, the rule, the 10 rules in the book always apply, and staying away from underage women, they're always off limits per the rules in the book, per the rules of society. Another risk, there is the impact of the financial cost to you. Like her services won't be free. They may cost a little. They may cost a lot. What if you get, also, what if you get addicted, you know, you're sexually addicted and have expenses every month, like huge expenses. Like if you're using sugar daddy services or expensive escorts, you can run up quite a huge bill and to the point perhaps where, you know, now it's, it's a, it's impacting your budget. You can't pay your rent. You can't buy your groceries. You can't do what you're, you can't save for the future because you, because you're spending too much money on sex for some reason, right? Another risk is you possibly not getting the service you were seeking and end up spending that money walking away unsatisfied. So you pick up a girl, street walker. I don't recommend you do that. Let's say you did. You pay her the money. She gets out the car to go buy something and runs off on you. Same thing with an escort. You have an escort come to your hotel. You're on a business trip. She comes to your home, whatever. She takes the money up front. Uh, and you do it because you're an honest guy. You want to go pay for services and show that she will get paid. And then she just runs out the door and you get to go, you know, and get nothing, right? Another risk is there is also the impact of your money that you spend on the sex trade in a place where prostitution is illegal, enabling damage and other negative impacts to neighborhoods or communities, especially from street prostitution. Like if the prostitution is happening in a massage parlor or a brothel or contained in some kind of way, Hopefully in a place where it's legal. Well, I guess if it's not, if it's out on the street, in neighborhoods, in front of schools where children and like normal people are, that's not great. Again, think about it. How would you like it if you spent a lot of money to purchase a home and when you open your front door every night, you see the sex trade outside? Right, you see women out there trying to flag down cars. You see parked cars with heads bobbing up and down, with guys getting a blowjob out there, right in front of your front door, depressing your um, property values. Then you have the concomitant, you know, the accompanying per perhaps um, violence to go and control the trade. Maybe crimes happen on the street. Do you feel comfortable even walking down the street? You know, taking a walk down the sidewalk. Right, so think about that. So after I've said all that, what is my recommendation for you after saying all that, right? The bottom line is the decision is up to you and I am no one who can judge anyone else. If you do decide to pay for sex, keep the risks we just went over top of mind. Remember, including the health, the financial impact, the impact on others, enabling a business where women are being abused, sex traffic, and all those horrible things. But if you do decide to pay for sex at any point, again, this is the open-minded part of it, right? I told you this is this episode is going to be raw and real, right? If you do decide to pay for sex at any point, make sure whether it's illegal or legal, treat the provider with respect. Treat everyone with respect. If whether we're talking about prostitution or anything else, right? Always treat people with respect. Your life will go much better if you um, live that way. So, no matter what, treat everyone with respect, even if she is committing a crime. She's a criminal, right? Respect more likely leads to better services. Uh, this is, um, I don't mean this to be um, funny. Picture yourself in her shoes, right? Are you more likely to get better service, a better blowjob if you're nice to her, got her laughing, and you're respectful of her? Or are you going to get her worse service, right? Uh, so, there's a, respect pays off in many, many ways. All right, how, I guess I should move on from that subject. If you really feel you have a need to, for paid sexual services, like you're in a relationship and everything is cool except for you have some need that is unfulfilled around sex, you're not satisfied, or maybe your woman's not doing one particular thing that you really like, but she just will never do it, and you don't ever you don't want to keep pushing the issue, and you just can't work that out with your lady, then you know, maybe, all right? What I don't recommend even if paid sex is legal around you, is for you to go around and get your knob polished out of revenge or spite or boredom. If you have some small argument or upset with her about something, if you need to use paid services or just cheat with like a, you know, a, a normal other lady, do it for an honest, honorable, and valid reason. Don't do it as an act of spite or out of revenge or because it's convenient for you and you don't care about the money and you want to blow off some steam or you think it's a dirty little bit of fun. I don't recommend that and I don't 
I can't speak for everybody, but I just don't think you're going to be really proud of yourself if you um, have sex with other women that way, right? All right, my strong preference, again, you know, I, I, I let me circle back to how I really feel about things. My strong preference is that you don't avoid the hard work, is that you avoid all the risks and potential problems that we mentioned a moment ago. I would prefer that you decide what you really want in your life around relationships, maybe having a wife and children and starting a family someday, and then use the principles and methods in the book to help achieve your goals honestly. Don't cheat it, right? But if that's, you know, again, I'm in no position to go and preach here, but I my strong preference is that if you really want to go have like a, a standard, normal family relationship and children and everything, put your work in, stick to the principles in the book, and just grind away every day. Stack those ones every day towards your goals. I think that approach will lead to a more deeply satisfying life for you and more long-term, genuine, lasting happiness. But again, who am I to judge? I am simply giving you advice, buddy. All right, that's all I have for this week. I'll see you next week. Take care.